Welcome to PDMA Corporation, home of the MCE Max. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Once again, we have Noah Bethel, the Vice President of Product Development with us. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And I am Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. And Noah, this brings us to the conclusion of our three-part series on what constitutes uh, the uh, successful motor maintenance program. Right. Quality control, number one. Trending, number two. And the final, troubleshooting. So we've already discussed, Trifecta, the importance of getting all three right. So if you get one, yes, you're going to be successful. If you get two, yep, you're going to be a little bit more successful. But when you get all three working in unison, that is where you reap the benefits or the maximum benefits that you can out of your reliability program. The big win. The big win, right? So. We've discussed that at length. So now we're down to our last portion here, troubleshooting. Yeah, you know, everything has an end of life. Motors and generators are the same. You want to be able to identify that you're in a situation where, you know, something's going to end, whether it's the motor, the generator, the power system, and be able to have the tools, the knowledge, the, you know, what you need to get in and troubleshoot properly. And you mentioned something there, have the correct tools. How many times have you been in a troubleshooting situation where you're just armed with not enough uh, technology to solve the issue. You mentioned our history of the of the military. I was on a submarine and we had a multimeter and a megometer. It was primarily the tools we had. Great tools, but certainly not enough to make us the best at troubleshooting. Right. They may fall short when you're really needing some of the intricacies of the data that uh, is being collected to Absolutely. find the root cause of the issue. So we're going to go and start out with a case study in this one here. It's about insulation, uh, persistent drive failure. Now, going through this, uh, this, this uh, information here, we can see that we've had four VFD drive failures within a short span. Wow, years. that's going to get somebody's attention. That is an expensive, short-term, you know, life expectancy for these drives. And we've just refurbished the motor. Right, and you wonder, did they do that because it was a time-based refurbishment, or were they just kind of like, you know, Doing a little Easter egg hunt? Yeah, yeah were, they, let's, were let's, they let's trying the motor to say, well, is it the motor or is it the drive? Exactly. Um, and then every time this drive fails, it's $45,000. I wonder if that even includes installation costs or if that's just the drive itself. That is uh, that is certainly cause to try and figure out why this is failing. Amen. And so we've also had uh, disruptions in the process. Well, the nuisance trips, as we as like to call it, are, are a common complaint that we get when, when assisting our customers in troubleshooting data and that kind of stuff. And uh, it can be so frustrating because, you know, is it the drive, like you said, is it the motor? What is causing those nuisance trips, which do affect production quite a lot? So this is the motor. It's a 400 horsepower, four pole motor. Um, uh, and that's what we're going to start testing. And we see that Remember, this was a newly refurbished motor, and we're at 145 corrected mega. Right, or our triple E standard wants us above 100, right? Um, but, you know, I'm assuming this is a form-wound coil because of the high currents and stuff. But um, if not, it can be a little bit lower. But here's the thing. Recently refurbished, even though 145 corrected is not a, an, uh, you know, a failing grade, it doesn't pass the, the, the comfort level for a refurbishment. And keep in mind, this is at the T leads now. Where Good we're catch. Testing yes, it. that's correct. The T leads indicates we've got cables, we've got motor, everything together being tested. So it may not be the motor. Correct. It may not be the motor. Now, why would we be concerned with the low resistance to ground when we're talking about in conjunction with a drive? Well, good good point. A lot of times when people or if you contact the drive manufacturer and complain about these nuisance trips, one of the first things the drive manufacturer is going to ask you is to check the ground you know, condition of the motor drive you know, combination. And so that motor... If, if it's not connecting in the drive, if it's not a good ground, and what I mean by that is, you know, the drives will use the neutral reference or the ground, basically common, as a, a means of determining when to fire the cards. And so if, that's, if that ground wall is, is, is not in a good condition, it will misfire and cause some problems. So we did another, uh, a little bit more comprehensive test. We first, uh, on our standard test, we just did a 60-second look at the installation. Now, this is a little more intricate looking at it, and we can see that we still have problems. This is a perfect picture of, of moisture contamination. The polarization index is like a long megometer test, right? Instead of just taking a snapshot 60 seconds, let's look at how the, the qualitative effect of the, of the voltage applied to the insulation occurs. This should be a nice gradual increase to values much higher than 200 meg. So the graph really helps you see visually what's happening with this insulation. So 
The next step was to let's disconnect it. What's troubleshooting, right? Absolutely. To isolate and conquer. Isolate and conquer. So would they disconnect the motor from the, te- from the motor leads and look at the power circuit separate from the motor. And this is the motor. Right. And if I'm seeing this motor at, at 3,400, 3.4 gig ohms measured and 1,700 corrected, I'm a lot more comfortable that the, the problem is not the motor itself. And as these, uh, the technicians here that were troubleshooting this, this is what they suspected as well, that maybe there was something in the conduit uh, with, the, with the power circuit. And this is just the motor itself on a polarization index. That graph is much better than what right, the first one. It's not perfect. One. A little bit of variance at the top, but we're talking 14,000 mega ohms, not 200. Right. And so because of the the changes in that we felt were in the power circuit, that it wasn't performing the way it should be, they wanted to go in and check in the conduit. Right. With see high if there expectations was water. that water would be there, right? But as you could see... No water was found. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, but they saw some other things that re- would constitute replacement of that power circuit, the cabling of the power circuit through the conduit. So they would, but all the while they would say, "Man, we're pretty convinced it's there." We that just PI test find was it. so so damning as far as the the evidence. I I would I would be, feel the same way. There's got to be something in there. So. While they're going through it, this is they're placing the old cable in on the ground, and look at that. Right. Gravity, right, just pulls the water out. It's a lot of water, too, and you notice it's focusing on phase two and three, but all three phases connected internally, and, that, and it makes a, a ton of sense now why the drives were struggling to fire properly at the right time. Now, how does water get in there? Water is an amazing thing, but through, you know, thermal expansion and contraction, as well as, as, as probably some, you know, potential energy as far as gravity, uh, it gets in probably way upstream and eventually gets pulled into the actual insulation itself. Okay. So once we re put everything back together and test it, we can see we've changed dramatically. Oh from yeah. Motor and cable together, still 1500, you know, corrected mega ohms, which is a great reading. Right, and our resistance balance is very low at zero, which is really good at the at the uh, the MCC where they test. Very this. good, especially for a four sixty volt motor. Right, it's been operating cleanly ever since. Yeah, no nuisance trips. This is this is huge. What a win for the technicians and the group involved in troubleshooting. Now it took one hundred eighty thousand dollars in drives to finally focus on the right problem. But let's hope that their future is going to be without nuisance. Well, it's certainly a learning event, right? So now the next time this happens, you maybe have a little more understanding in where to attack first. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of our three-part series where we part one was focused on quality assurance, part two was focused on trending, and now part three is focused on diagnostics or troubleshooting and making sure you have the comprehensive tools at your disposal so that you can really solve the problem. Apply that trifecta in your maintenance program. And as always, we thank you for listening in on this three-part series. And if you have any suggestions on or other case studies you would like to give to us, we'd be more than happy to look at them and see if we can put them on our YouTube channel. As always, thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you guys again.